Welcome to the HR Empowerment Podcast, where we will uncover strategies and new insights from HR professionals who discuss up-to-date regulations, best practices, and the most pressing topics like diversity and equity, leadership, dealing with difficult situations, and much more that affect your bottom line and business. Thanks for joining us. Hey everybody, Wendy Sellers, the HR lady, and JC. Hi. We're back. We're back talking about the topic of quiet quitting, which has made a huge um, mark, I guess I would say, on TikTok recently. And a TikToker who is a millennial said, that's it. I'm not going to overwork myself anymore. And I don't know why I this is a bad thing. And JC and I agree. Yeah. And hopefully you do too. Yeah, I, I really don't think it's a bad thing to stand up for yourself. At the end of the day, a little bit of self-care never hurt. But um, it, there are differing opinions on the uh, depth of quiet quitting. One perspective being not willing to go above 40 hours in a week because they used to put in 50 to 60. Well, another perspective is I'm going to do less than the bare minimum. Right. You might right. just be and asking to get fired at that rate then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. And, and the thing is, if your managers aren't catching on to that, then that's a management issue. But then that's really a company issue that you promote to people who shouldn't be managers into management roles, or you promote to people hope on a, you know, a wing and a prayer to say, oh, this person, this John Doe over here, Jane Doe is going to be an amazing manager all on their own with no help from us. And that's our expectations moving forward. Even though yesterday they were, they were an employee and today they're a manager. <laughs> <laughs> Just snap your fingers and magic happens. <laughs> but it really is, you know, what, what you just mentioned is a lot of the research that I'm finding on the, the quiet quitting and the millennials even, who are the ones that are saying, I'm not going to overwork myself anymore is, they actually were working the 50 and 60 hours. It's not yeah. like they were working 42 hours and complaining about it. Yeah. And so that's a lot to ask for, for um, anybody, you know, I don't care what your age is, but if you're, if the offer letter said 40 hours or 40 hours ish a week, then that should be what it is sticking to. Otherwise you should be having a conversation with your employee saying, I need things to change. I need more from you. And this is what I'm going to do to help you out and maybe compensate you differently. You know, it's, it's a real tough world when you think about it, where said employee had to make sure that they had a master's degree, that they were applying for their doctorate, had 12 years experience for the entry level job. Yeah. You factor that <laughs> in plus the six figure debt that they had and the 60 hours a week, and they haven't even started the family yet or chosen to travel the world or become a, a, a puppy parent or whatever it is that they want to do. Let them do it, you know? Right. But you're not going right. to do that working 60 to 90 to 120 hours a week. Allowing yourself to put other things before work without feeling bad about it is one of the definitions of quiet quitting in a way. Yeah. And that's, that's just, that's uh, embarrassing to our, our culture in the United States. We really, you know, as, as uh, business owners and, and leaders should be helping employees set boundaries. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, as an employee and you're sitting here thinking, yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready to quiet quit, or maybe I already have and I'm feeling guilty about it. What can, what can you do to start setting boundaries either gradually or just draw a line in the sand? Uh, there's this article on uh, small business cron and it, it basically says how to set boundaries and guidelines for employees. And I definitely see a lot of uh, useful information here. But the first thing I would say is let's pull out your job description and look at it. So that means you need to have a job description. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how many organizations do not have job descriptions? Uh, probably 10 percent. Don't I would say probably I off the top of my head, I don't know the percentage, but I would say way more than 10%. The reason I say this is majority of businesses are actually small businesses. So just a handful of employees. Um, when we usually think sometimes when we're talking about business, we're, we're thinking hundreds of thousands of employees or even, you know, hundreds of employees or 50 employees, but majority of businesses in the United States are mom and pop shops. 
um, with a couple employees and they certainly do not have job descriptions. If you do, I congratulate you, but they're usually the people that are calling me and I'm giving them the formats I'm helping them figure out a job description. Why do we care about a job description? What does it do for employees? Yeah, we're looking to uh, define that industry standard in a way, right? Yeah, and set boundaries to say, hey, I can't find people. Everybody's retired or no one wants to work anymore, which again is also complete BS. But Ooh, Or you it, might be outlining the fact that, you know, the box won't be more than 25 pounds to be lifted. Right, exactly, exactly. It's going to give you very clear ideas of ideas of what needs to be done in the workplace before we even put a job ad out. Yeah. Hey, here's the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need. Here's the experience. No, you do not need 10 years to lift this box. You need one minute of experience because I'm going to show you how to properly do it safely. So when you're throwing out those things of 10 years experience or heck, even six years or five years, you are probably unintentionally or intentionally already setting your company up for failure that A, a 20 year old's not going to have that experience. However, they're the only one that's going to want to do that job in order to get experience in your industry. So brushing off the job, job description and making it realistic is the number one thing that I would tell um, any employer, but then employee, if you're sitting here going, you know, when do you write? I don't have a job description. Go ask for one. Don't be all, you know, smart, Alec, though, because your employer may be trying their best. Just say, hey, I notice I'll have a job description. Do you want me to work on one for you? And then there are so many job descriptions already pre-built all over the Internet on the Department of Labor websites. Um, and you could download things and then fill in the blanks and then help your manager to help you set boundaries. Is there ever a situation where, as the employer or the employee, that we would have to define when there's no boundaries, no boundaries scenarios? Yeah, in the job description, in the ad, it also says <laughs> other duties as as required. Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> well, just so you know, the other duties as required needs to be realistic. Um, it needs to be in line with the main knowledge, skills, and abilities that are required for that job. And if your other duties are re as required end up being a lot of manual labor, guess what? That salaried position now turns into an hourly position by law because of all your other duties as required. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have to pay overtime and it's going to cost you anyway. So the funny thing I, I, I think is uh, funny about the other duties as required, because I have a lot of clients and we, we giggle about that and everything. And I'm like, this does not allow you to abuse people, you know, <laughs> right. this does not allow you to give them anything at all because we have the ADA to deal with. We have possibly leave issues to deal with. You know, we have accommodation. So if your other duties as required are not defined, employees speak up and say, I want these clearly defined. Uh, just again, do it as professionally as possible. Nobody likes being attacked. You don't like being attacked. Your employer is not going to like being attacked. So let them know, hey, I'm struggling. I, employee, I'm struggling. I need to set boundaries for my mental health, my physical health, whatever the reason is. And um, I need you, manager, to help me, but I'm going to help you help me. You know, help me help you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got a question for the HR lady here. So when we, when we think about that job description, there might be a certain layer of detail associated with that, you know? We might be working hard to make sure that it's written the right way, but maybe not too limiting. And when we think about the employee handbooks or policy descriptions, things that we might need to revise or, or put in place as we're taking a look at job descriptions and other things that we have documented, should we take a stab at that on our own and be very specific and, and narrow it down so that there are strict interpretations across the board? Or do we put ourselves at risk as employers if we do that? You know, it's a great question, and, and my answer is going to be the, the legal answer of it depends. Um, and it really does. It depends on your workplace culture, because for some cultures, they'd be like, awesome. Thank you for taking that on, employee. Um, this is awesome. Schedule a meeting, and let's talk about it and get this done. Yeah. Other cultures be like, whoa, 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 you're way out of line here. And, you know, in some, in some organizations, I'm thinking of some clients that I have that are highly um, – scientific and uh, regulated. So they're highly regulated by the by the government. 
you know, and quality control, FDA things, things like that, that it, it really shouldn't be the employee doing it on your own because you may not understand any of those regulations and litigation concerns. And so that's, you know, in that type of organization, you should go to your manager, your manager's manager, your manager's manager, manager, if you can't, you know, get somewhere. Um, but the mentality of saying, I, the employee, can do no wrong. I, the employee, am, am going to, you know, tell them what to do. That's the wrong mentality. It should always be, I want to help you so that you can help me and we can be successful together. And for, for the managers that are listening today, please take that in mind. If, if an employee is coming to you and saying, I'm struggling, stop what you're doing and listening, even if they're the worst employee, even if they're the employee that drives you batty, that also comes down to, well, why are they still there then? Um, you know, how desperate are you that you're keeping this employee on, on, um, on payroll and letting them get away with this behavior. And for the small business owner, for the, for the smaller organization that doesn't have those job descriptions as they, they work with, uh, someone who's contracted HR support, like you mentioned, or, or find things online to grow with, uh, descriptions in that manner. When we're thinking about handbooks and, and policy descriptions from the small business owner perspective, what's a good way to tackle that? You know, I would uh, lean on your HR department if you don't have an HR department, um, an HR consultant, you know, things that, that I do. It doesn't need to be me. It could be anybody. There's a ton of us out there. I have a lot of people I could recommend as well. You know, we have to get our ducks in order. We have to say, here's our policies. Your policy goes, book doesn't need to be 100 pages. You know, my simple one's like 20 pages. It's like, here's our policies. Here's the work times. Here's the expectations of working outside the work times. What needs to be approved? Um you're going to always have some employees like myself, but I'm learning, as I just mentioned, um, that, you know, want to go above and beyond. But if the company says, no, we don't want you to do that because everybody needs to be treated somewhat equally, then you need to have rules to say, Wendy, you can't come in on Saturday and work by yourself because A, there's a safety concern if you do that, or B, that is against our, our culture and our values. Excellent. And the employees need to be very, very clear about that. Yeah, no. If they don't know, how are they going to know? <laughs> Excellent points. And to that then, uh, now we've laid that base, when we think about training our supervisors, training our managers on, on how to evaluate employee behavior, is that as simple as uh, how they used to do it, lick their finger and put it in the wind? To try to determine yeah. which way it's blowing, right? Is, yeah, let's is, see. Are they smiling? Oh, they're good then. Yeah, yeah, right? So <laughs> is is training the supervisors and evaluating employee behavior something that we should document and map out? What's one of the more effective ways that we could train our staff to be more in tune with that? Yeah. So remember the days, which was like yesterday, where you had to do your annual um sexual harassment training, you oh, know, yeah. and everybody loved that. Oh, yay. I can't wait to go that training about how I can't do this and I can't do that. And no, 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 no. I, th I think well, I have to take that training three times a year by mandate. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It, it, you know, I'm it, kidding. But it, you know what, though? In some states, you actually do. Twice. Um, and in many other states, <laughs> yeah. yeah, many other states, you you know, there's just, it's, it's uh, free for all, but lawyers recommend it. Well, I change in my practice because, as you know, I do a lot of management training. That's a majority of what I do these days um, because it's easier and more cost effective to do management training than to, you know, pay myself or a lawyer to fix all the problems and, and possible lawsuits. And then on top of that, DO, Department of Labor lawsuits, uh, EEOC lawsuits against you. Anyway, you need to figure out what kind of training needs to be done in your organization. So I've changed the sexual harassment training, unless it's a mandatory one. I've changed it to professionalism, respect, and trust in the workplace. And then there's just a little bit in there on harassment as a whole, not just sexual harassment, all kinds of harassment. Yeah. And, you know, I when I'm doing that now, employees are actually there asking questions, not in their head, taking notes. They're interested because they're like, wait, 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 we know don't sexually harass somebody. But wow, let's talk about this a little bit more about trust in the workplace and how it makes me feel 
Yes. And it, I find that it really opens up the conversation that that employees go, oh, that's totally me over here. I'm an introvert. And you guys really, really scare me when you do that. And now everybody in the team goes, oh, I didn't know that. Now I know what you mean by respect and professionalism right. based off of what your needs are, not based off what my desires are. Oh, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. Getting, Talk about an really- awakening. You know, it really is. It's yeah. like, I, I got to tell you, it's been an awakening for me, too, because doing the sexual harassment training is so boring and it's just like it's necessary, but it's so boring. But when I mix it in with everybody else, everything else and employees are like, hey, hey, I have a question. I have a question. And I'm like, oh, this is an engaged workforce here because now we're speaking to them. We're letting them know these are the behavioral expectations in this company. Okay, here's the laws. Here's the behavioral expectations in this company. Here's what you can do when you're feeling out of sorts, who you can go to. Um, here's our benefits. Here's our policies, you know, our health care, our mental health care. And this is what your manager is going to do for you. And if your manager doesn't do it, then go to the next level, the next level, the next level. Who all is also sitting in that training? So you're all on the same page together. With that said, JC, I want to take a minute here and wrap this section up. And so we could go on to the last session of our podcast today and talk a little bit more about um, empowerment, getting your boundary set. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that even your boss might want to quit, quiet quitting. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining the HR Empowerment Podcast, brought to you by Aurora Training Advantage. We hope you've gained new insight and strategies to navigate the HR profession. We look forward to you joining us again on the HR Empowerment Podcast.